voiceover is everywhere, and you hear it every day from radio. Number one for New Country 96.3 Hawkeye in the morning. To TV. My name is Lady Whistledown. You do not know me, but I know you. To movies. My name is Optimus Prime. Autobots, roll out. To animation. I am vengeance. I am the knight. I am Batman. And so much more. I'm loving it. Welcome to episode two. Welcome to Who Did That Voice, the show where we take an in-depth look at the world of voiceover, including movies, TV, animation, and more. And now, here's your host, Trenton Larkin. Today on the show, we have the talented and lovely Katie Lee. Katie has been in the business of voiceovers for over 35 plus years. She's done amazing voices from shows like Adventures in Odyssey as Connie Kendall. Hey, what's going on? Having trouble with your shoelaces again, Eugene? She also starred on Walt Disney's Darkwing Duck as Honker Muddlefoot. Mm. It's your dad's cheap cologne. Katie also played the lovable Sunny Gummy from Walt Disney's Adventures of the Gummy Bears. Thank you, Gruffy. Here's a fun fact. Katie played the piano-loving dog Rolf from The Muppet Babies. Is here. Katie is also the one and only voice of Dumbo from Walt Disney's Dumbo Circus. Lionel, where's my magic feather? Today we have the illustrious Katie Lee joining us today. Thank you so much for joining <laughs> us, Katie. I'm illustrious. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Katie, would you do us the honor of just giving us a brief story of who you are? <laughs> a little brief story about me. Well, in a nutshell, everybody tells me I'm weird, but I'm nice. <laughs> I grew up in Southern California. I went to college in Northern California. And when I decided to try doing voiceover, I had to move back to Southern California. That was in the 80s. And that's when um, I was, it was a perfect time for me to be here. There was a lot of animation going on. There were probably about 200 people in the voiceover community. I was able to fit right in at that time and learn on the job. And I have a very, very fortunate career that in that respect. Um, I got to learn from all the old timers and I've watch the I'm like I feel like I'm the bridge I'm the bridge generation between the the original voiceover animation actors and all the new people coming up so that's a brief description of my voiceover career I guess uh I'm a mom and I have a 16 year old dog (laughs) and uh, what else do you want to know well Katie from what I understand growing up in California, you had a lot of friends who wanted to be actors, and you had kind of thought of going a different route, potentially as a producer, I believe. Oh, yeah. Well, because I grew up, you know, in Southern California, where every, you know, Hollywood is, that's what people think of. And and I knew that, I mean, I, I grew up like imitating people and talking to myself, but I'm pretty shy. And in a way, I mean, it depends. I've gotten a little over that since I've gotten older. You definitely don't seem shy. (laughs) Well, I wasn't a theater person. Okay. I wasn't a musical person. Yeah, the theater people seemed just way too dramatic for me. And I wasn't into all that drama. But I knew I liked the industry, but I was hesitant to want to pursue anything in the industry as a career because I knew how difficult it was and how cliche it was, basically. I think I was just a little, you know, thinking that, well, you know, that's everybody's dream, right? So... Because I was a really fast typist and I like machines, I thought, oh, I think I will strive to be an executive secretary. Because at that time, believe it or not, in the 70s, I was like, oh, that's a job that pays a lot of money. Because there were no computers or anything back then. You needed it. Yeah, absolutely. So I thought, okay, I'd like to be a secretary or a teacher. And then um, as I pursued you know, my higher education and knowing that I still really like the entertainment industry, I thought, well, maybe a, a producer would be something I would be good at. And I ended up getting a degree in broadcast communication arts from San Francisco State. Thought maybe I'd be an audio engineer, but I don't think I was quite that good. And the thought of being in a dark room for 8 to 12 hours a day was sort of didn't sound like fun. Yeah, uh, Especially when had other people telling me what to do and running a board. So 
And while I was um, living up there, someone suggested I do voiceover. I didn't know I had an unusual voice, to tell you the truth. But right before I got in the broadcast department, I started pursuing voiceover as a means of maybe making some extra income. I really didn't think of it as anything, uh, as, you know, as a career yeah, at absolutely. time. And uh, a woman named Lucille Bliss who some might know as Smurfette and some older people may even know as Crusader Rabbit's voice, lived in San Francisco and she had a voiceover workshop. And uh, I signed up for her. I, I went to go to her workshop. I got to the very last class. For some reason, she invited me. I think it may have been auditing. I don't even know if I paid her, to tell you the truth. Auditing the last class, sat in on that, and we went and made a demo. I mean, this. I don't recommend this to anybody. Okay, there's. I mean, but there's a big industry out there, and you got to be aware. You know, it's very expensive. You can get sucked into the voiceover vacuum of unending payments. So you want to, you know, be really sure that it's, you know, it's in your budget, and and you got to figure out what your goals are. Um, so I highly recommend taking acting lessons. And I will say. While I was finding myself, I started taking improv classes. I think it was before I even did the voiceover, maybe simultaneously. But I started doing improv workshops, which I really loved and enjoyed. And I ended up working my way through my teachers, all the levels, until the next. I said, what's the next class? And she says, oh, we're on stage. So I told you I wasn't a theater person, right? And yeah. I was like, mm-hmm. oh, we're doing a show? Because I just love the exercises. I love the games. I love the, I liked improv. And so the last class was we were doing a show. And uh, so I found myself on stage doing improv for a few years. And that was fun. So that was my training, if you want to call it training for voiceover. But so seriously, we we went, we made, Lucille helped me make a demo. She gave me copy. It was enough to get me a couple agents in San Francisco. I was able to land one gig that got me into the Screen Actors Guild. And so when I graduated college and everybody said, you know, you have a great voice. You're not really going to find work here in San Francisco. It's different these days because there's a lot of video games up there and stuff, I think. And of course, it doesn't matter where you live like today. It doesn't matter too much. You can find voiceover work, you know, working from home and work yeah. for people all over the world. But at that time, they said, if you want to do animation, you need to go to L.A. And I was like, oh, man, I just left there. I know. <laughs> but I thought, you know, it's worth a shot. So I decided to, I had my card, my SAG card. So I called an agency and as luck would have it or Providence would have it, my agent was filling in. Oops. Sorry. That's my phone. That's okay. Um, uh, my agent was filling in for the receptionist and answered the phone and she heard me and she said, uh, you sound like you're 12. And I said, okay, thanks. <laughs> and I, I'd like to meet you. So I went down to L.A. and back home and had a meeting with the agency, and they wanted to sign me. <laughs> and so I figured, well, I'll give it two years and see if I can make a living at this. And I came back to L.A. and worked as a, a – I found a little company where I worked as an editor, receptionist. voice. It was a, a small company where we did everything. I answered the phones. I was a secretary. I got to do that. If they needed a voice like mine, they'd call me into the studio. I helped edit scripts, and I edited tape with a razor blade, which I actually enjoyed doing very much. Wow. And um, I my gig, I got a, a voiceover. I started auditioning, and then I booked a part in a Mark and Mindy cartoon. And Mark and Mindy had a cartoon? They had a cartoon, and I thought, wow, oh, wow I was so excited. I thought I was going to work with Robin Williams, but I didn't. He wasn't there. I went in. It was at Hanna-Barbera. So it was this one part, and I thought it was going to be a recurring role, and I told my boss, and she said, well, you just can't take off and you know, go do this. So you can't work here anymore. So I got fired and the part was not a recurring role. It was just a one-time thing. And there I was, but somehow, I don't know what happened. I guess I made, (laughs) I just started booking more things and uh, it happened. And as I was telling you before you started the interview, you know, now I get fired every day. Basically, I mean, that's what it boils down to. You do a job, it's over, that's it. You're looking for the next one. Looking for the next next employer, mm-hmm. yeah. With the Mork and Mindy cartoon, did Robin Williams actually voice his oh, yeah. character in yeah, that? Yeah, he did, okay. and Pam Dauber, but they weren't okay. there when I went in to do my, my lines, so I was okay. really disappointed. 
<laughs> and and uh, Jonathan Winters worked on it too. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Did you ever at any point get a chance to work with Robin Williams? Unfortunately, no, I did okay. not. But when I was living in San Francisco, he was living in San Francisco too and doing improv at the same time. Okay. And I didn't meet him, but I, I, I'm I, sure I saw him, I think, at the Holy City Zoo or somewhere. I mean, it seems like our paths crossed, but yeah, you know, just he, never he wasn't as famous at that time. But everybody knew him. Nobody wanted to really be on stage with him because he was very hard to do improv with because he just sort of took over. So that was his <laughs> I couldn't imagine that. Yeah, right? <laughs> it's, it's a challenge. That was his yeah. reputation at the time. So, no, I didn't get to. And that I wish I, wish I could have. That would have yeah. been awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Katie, um, how did you end up becoming involved with Disney's animation? Was it through your first initial uh, interaction, as far as I understand it, to be with Dumbo Circus? Was that your first Disney interaction? I think so, because um, Dumbo Circus, yeah, was for the Disney Channel. Mm -hmm. It wasn't animated. And it was new because the Disney Channel had just kind of been established at that point. Disney Channel had been on maybe a year or two because they did Pooh Corner first. Okay. And then, which Will Ryan, my buddy, he was in Pooh Corner. He used to do songs for Disney when he moved to California. So he did, he was in Pooh Corner. And then uh, Dumbo Circus, I got cast as Dumbo, and that was animatronic. So what happened when Eisner decided that Disney was going to do animation, Saturday Mm -hmm. morning animation, he called a meeting and he turned the record department into the animation department and a guy named Jim Magon was put in charge to create a show that Eisner called the gummy bears because his kids had come home from camp and he had they had these candies gummy bears and he thought it would be a neat idea for a cartoon (laughs) (laughs) that's the story I heard so Magon watched cartoons I was in a couple other shows before Disney started and he would look to see what voice actors were on those shows and invited those people in to audition and I guess I got caught in the net thank god and um, (laughs) so I auditioned for the gummy bears and got that role and that's how gummy bears was their first animated series that was aired it was aired I think one or two seconds before the wuzzles they actually produced two shows that year and but ours was the first one to air um, in a horse race, we would have won. So, yeah, <laughs> and, awesome. and we ran a lot longer. We had many more seasons than the Wuzzles. So, yeah, the Wuzzles was cute, but yeah, it definitely did not run as long. Well, as... our show had my my the voices of my childhood. You know, Bill Scott and June Foray and Paul Winchell and all the people I grew up listening to and watching on television. So, you know, they had the best of the best on that show. So it was pretty amazing. Lorenzo Music worked on that show. Uh, Will Ryan was on there, too. But it was a um, we had an amazing cast. So I think if you consider the talent and the the maybe even the voice recognition and the and the artwork i mean the artwork was i think excelled the wuzzles it was a classic style so i mean it had a the gummy bears had a lot going for it yeah well as far as dumbo goes you were the only voice of dumbo i believe there was a continuity director uh, les perkins who <laughs> ended up getting hired on before Dumbo got approved. And then at that point, they decided to not have Dumbo speak, but y'all had already been approved before he had made that decision. Is that correct? Um, Well, no, I think they hired him after Gummy Bear when they started doing animation. So, okay, Okay. yeah, but he, yeah, I met him and he said, that one slipped by. If I had been working at that time, there would have been no Dumbo talking. (laughs) <laughs> well, thank goodness that didn't happen because yeah. uh, Dumbo talking was very, I loved it. You know, as a kid watching Dumbo Circus, I remember seeing it on the Disney Channel and it was just so amazing to see those characters like so lifelike, even though they were animatronics, <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> yeah, I that's actually awesome. went in to read for the cat. Okay. Um, that's what I auditioned for. And then the producer said, hey, would you mind reading for Dumbo? I'm like, sure. <laughs> and uh, that was, I, that's pretty wonderful. Absolutely. Well, Katie, would you just tell us a little bit about how you became involved with the Darkwing Duck show? Darkwing? Well, by then I was working on a lot of shows. I had a pretty steady career. Darkwing, you don't happen to know what came first, Darkwing or My Little Pony, do you? Yes, actually. 
My Little Pony did come first. Ginny McSwain was the director on My Little Pony, and Ginny McSwain also directed Darkwing Duck. And she, and I don't know if Ponies was the first thing she directed, but so we got to know each other really well. And I just remember her asking me, like calling me into audition for Darkwing Duck, and there's this character honker. I mean, she had me in mind, and she said, do that that little nasally boy voice you do. <laughs> I said, okay, and... And uh, again, very fortunately, I got the gig. And that's what I I did Hulker Muddlefoot, who was Goswood's best friend. <laughs> and it's so amazing to hear you actually do the voice of Honker Muddlefoot, <laughs> because you do sound so much like your other character on Adventures in Odyssey, Connie Kendall. And growing up with her, I never realized that you were so many voices from my childhood that I loved and cherished as a kid growing up. Uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy. You don't realize it till time goes by and you look back and, and just see this like, you know, it's it's a cartoon image of taking a sheet of paper and, you know, reading, a you know, the king's court and the guy's going to read and the paper rolls across the floor and you go, wow, we did all that. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, speaking of Adventures in Odyssey, how did you end up becoming a part of that show? By force. By force. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was, um, I got saved and, you know, was really committed to giving my life to the Lord. And, um, I was working on some shows at a time when a gentleman probably from Texas too wrote a book that caused quite a stir in the church and claiming that most cartoons were demonic and nobody should be watching them. And, and at the same time I was working on a show called Dungeons and Dragons, which, um, you know, was like his big, one of his big targets, besides the Smurfs, um, that were all demonic and polluting everybody's family with. And I felt so terrible, like, oh, you know, am I involved in something that's, you know, should I quit? Is this cartoon world a, a bad place to be in? You know, I sure like my paycheck, but I don't, you know, I want to do what's right. And just, you know, praying about it. And one day, you know, just I wanted to be part of something um, that would share, you know, good values and, you know, bless people. And um, I heard, I was listening to Focus on the Family broadcast and heard a, a broadcast of a radio drama. And Hal Smith was in it, who also worked on Pooh Corner and Dumbo Circus. And I oh, we worked on the Little Prince together. I just knew him. And uh, some other voices that I knew were professional actors. And I thought, wow, Focus is using real actors. And that day I heard it, I happened to be in the same city as Focus on the Family, which is not near where I live. And I went to a phone booth, which existed back then with telephone books. And I looked up their address and I drove over there and I gave them my demo reel. And I said, I would really like to work with you guys if you're using voice actors here. And I started um, doing a few little things with them. And I, and I worked on one of their family portraits and, and then they were like getting their idea together of Adventures in Odyssey. And I was told they were writing a part for me. They were doing this new show and I would be a part of it. And sure enough, they did. And, uh, and now we're going on 30 years and I think it's the biggest blessing in my life. And I know that it's touched people all over the world. And, and I really feel like God answered my prayer. Absolutely, Katie. That's that's amazing. I know it definitely blessed my family growing up. We used to listen to Odyssey each night before bed. And on road trips, you know, we would tell our mom and dad, hey, how much longer till we're there? And they'd be like, oh, about three or four more Odysseys. <laughs> and, you know, you're not the first person to tell me that. A lot of people judge their car trips by how many Odysseys it would take to get there. And you lived in Israel, We right? did. We lived in Israel for a while. Um, my parents were doing missionary work, so... <laughs> Yeah, I remember your sister used to write to yeah. me, and so I, w I would know what was going on with the Larkin family. <laughs> yeah, she, uh, she, we've all been impacted by the show and, and by you and your character because you've been such an integral part since the beginning. That's right. I don't know if you know this, Katie, but the whole reason I created Who Did That Voice is because of voice actors and voice actresses like yourself who inspired me as a kid to want to know who did that voice. So I created this show to help people realize that voiceovers are used in more than just animation. Oh, mm -hmm. Like with your part in Indiana Jones Temple of Doom when you played the voice of the Maharaja? <laughs> 
Well, people don't realize that a lot of voices in movies are re- are dubbed over once they get into post-production. And sometimes the actors are available and sometimes the actors aren't available and sometimes the actors are capable. Uh, when they're children, a lot of times they'll have an adult dub in their voice if they need to be dubbed because kids don't dub that well if they're depending on their age. Yeah. In this case, I know I auditioned for this part. I don't even know if I heard his voice when I auditioned. They were doing the post-production here in Los Angeles, and and I I was shot. Who knows where that kid was, if he was in England, if he was in India. I don't know. And and I don't know why they were dubbing it, but really I I, I was trying to do a voice match. That's what a lot of people do, voice matches. Um, And so I they hired me to dub his voice. I honestly can't tell you why they wanted it dubbed. When I got to the studio, Spielberg was in England. So he was in a different time zone. It was just me and the it was just oh, wow. me and the engineer. I said, "So, did you get any notes? Do we know why we're doing this?" She said, "No, I don't know why." And I said, "Oh, great. Well, hmm, let's just match his voice as best we can and assume that maybe they just need a clean track." So I didn't you sometimes they'll say, you know, we can improve the performance and you know, we can have a little more freedom, you know, to make it better. And I was pretty young back then. So nowadays if I would have done it, I would have certainly done like exactly what he sounded like and then maybe try to change the inflection or make it make more sense but I didn't know what the director wanted and neither did she so we just played it really straight and just matched his performance as best we could and and sent it off to wherever it went and that's that's yeah. how that happened well and it's it's so interesting because you know even growing up as a kid I didn't realize myself that voiceovers were used for so much more than just animation you know like commercials audiobooks and and so many other different uh, avenues commercials and stuff and have you done any other works besides just movies and animation like have you done commercials or audiobooks or anything oh like my that? goodness yes um I've done lots when I started in voiceover you know I did commercials and and actually some of the big paying commercials I dubbed. They had kids in them. If you go to my website, voiceofyourchildhood.com or katielee.com, you'll see an ADR reel, which means uh, it's dubbing, looping, ADR. They're all the same name, uh, dialogue replacement. And you can see I found now thanks to YouTube and the magic of the interwebs, um, a commercial I had done in the 80s um, for 7-Up. And so I was able to add that to my reel where I just looped this little girl's voice um they needed it redone they usually kids just aren't speaking clearly enough so they want enunciation Mm -hmm. i was doing (laughs) an instant potato campaign for a while my last sessions for those guys i was actually in labor with my daughter we had to leave (laughs) we had to leave the studio to go have a baby i had to come back to finish it about six weeks later (laughs) two three more spots oh goodness and audiobooks um I've done a few audiobooks. Um, I, I prefer to do children's books because my attention span is about <laughs> that long. Uh, but I love to do children's audiobooks and educational things. I actually directed a, an uh, audio version of a screenplay called Rex Tanner and the Sword of Damocles that I'm super proud of. Um, it was a sort of experimental project, and I got all my excellent voiceover buddies to lend their talents to me. And uh, you can find it on audible.com. Um, it's not expensive, and it's super fun. And it was my first experience directing and casting, you know, the whole project. And um, shout out to my, my husband, Vinny J, who did the sound design. Well, speaking of books, Katie, don't you and Will Ryan have a book together? Oh, well, Will and I recorded our book. Will Ryan and I wrote a book called Adventures in Oddity last year. Just a fun book, sort of um, tongue-in-cheek, disproving the the notion that Will and I are anything like the characters we play on Adventures (laughs) in Odyssey. So, Katie, for anyone who's interested in your book, they just go to your website? Yeah, well, it's all over. It is on Amazon, but you can go to my website, the website, voiceofyourchildhood.com. I know you were talking about the interwebs of things online, and it kind of made me think of Muppet Babies, and you played Rolf, and I know there was one episode where you actually played Spider Rolf. Do you remember that? I know! I saw that! Somebody reposted that. I was like, that is amazing. (laughs) That was pretty cool. Well, 
our director, Hank Saroyan, used to just, you know, always jump on any current themes of the day. So, yeah, Stan Lee's in that episode. Yeah, I mean, the stuff you guys did on that show was just fantastic. I mean, y'all would go on all kinds of adventures with Star Wars and Star Trek and just, like you said, all the current things that were of the day, the Muppet Babies would go on those adventures, and those those were fantastic to see. Yeah, it was a very creative, groundbreaking show. You know, because we had music. We had a song in every show. Yeah, I love that. The musical aspect of that show was so awesome. I mean, were did y'all have different writers that did the songs each time? Or was it the same group or people? Yeah. Janice Liebhardt and Alan O'Day. Alan O'Day was a pretty popular songwriter. Um, he had some hits. And they wrote our songs. Hank Saroyan helped, too. Um, our engineer, Rob Walsh. But those were the ones that mainly did the songs for us every week. And... I don't know how we did that. I mean, that's now that I think about it. I mean, I remember recording the episodes. Was there a song in every episode? Maybe not. Almost. Probably. If not if not every episode, almost. Because you I, were the instigator with the uh, piano and all. Yeah. <laughs> but we had enough. I don't think they were in every episode. Maybe they were. You know what? That's a good, let's Google that. Because my brain, I didn't even think about this for a long time. <laughs> but we did co- produce two record albums from the show. And I remember when we went to the studio to record the songs. You know why? Because the songs were done after. We didn't do them like the same week. I think that's why we would, you know, they'd write the shows and there was a place for a song. And then we, we were, go- you know, like it's every kid's dream, right? To be in a recording studio with headphones, like you're singing. And I remember <laughs> we went down to do our first songs and I was just so excited and, and blown away and, and, and afraid because I'm really not a singer. So, um, you know, it was interesting. We that first session, we were, I think, at the studio till midnight or one o'clock because our director was a perfectionist. And he learned that we learned that night we all could not sing together. We had to do it separately. So that was, you know, trial and error. We all couldn't do it. And Howie and Mandel and I were the two worst. So we got special attention. <laughs> Some of the people were singers. So it was no no big deal for them. But for us, it was a little more of a challenge. But We did it. That's awesome. Well, I know with my research on Muppet Babies, I realized that Barbara Billingsley was the voice of Nanny. And I was like, wow, because I remember watching Leave it to Beaver. And I knew the voice sounded familiar, but I, I had no recollection of her being Nanny until researching it for our interview. What was it like working with her? Did you have much interaction with her or? Oh, yeah. Um, she graced us with her elegant presence every time. And she was such a lovely lady. Um, she was married to a doctor and just, you know, she came to this, she was always dressed so beautifully. And I remember asking her, Barbara, why do you wear pearls to the studio? Nobody's seeing you here. Cause we're like, you know, schlumps, right? We're just like dragging in cause I don't know. We're like, voiceover actors are kind of like the nerds and geeks of the acting world. Yeah. Um, I'm, I've come to realize a few Comic-Cons under my belt. <laughs> um, and Barbara, you know, she said, well, I dress nicely because it, it, I don't know if she used the word bless, but maybe, you know, it, it, it it's a gift, you know, it's a bless, you know, it's nice for the people who are with me to be and and ever since she said that then I thought you know what it doesn't matter where you go you know it's up to us to make other people feel comfortable and and you know it's not all about me she kind of opened my eyes to considering other people and uh, um, that's a confession personal confession so yeah she was great Katie thank you so much for that story about Barbara Billingsley that was really wonderful to hear Are there any particular projects you're working on right now that you'd like to share with our listeners today? What am I working on? Well, I do work on a show called Space Racers. Can I just say something about my daughter has a project? She started like a photo essay called Humans of New York, and this is about kids with type 1 diabetes. She's just bringing people's stories sharing them so that kids around the world who are diabetic are, some of them think they're the only ones and she's sharing their stories. So I'm really proud of her. Um, it's just my, just my type one.com. 
And then, of course, I'm, I've just joined the staff of the Global Voice Acting Academy, and I'll be teaching classes. So you can go to my website, and there's a link. I'm on staff there for coaching, and I do some private coaching. Oh, that's excellent to know that you do private coaching as well. Well, Katie, thank you so much for joining us today. It was an absolute pleasure and honor. I hope to have you back on the show again soon. Would you please do us the honor of closing us out today on Who Did That Voice? Close you out? Just surprise us. So thanks for listening to Who Did That Voice? I'm Katie Lee. I play Connie Kendall on Adventures in Odyssey. I play on Honker Buttlefoot on Darkwing Duck. I was Sunny Gummy and the Gummy Bears. And I was Dumbo on Dumbo Circus. Well, that's our show for today, boys and girls. I hope you liked it. Hey, everyone, and thanks so much for listening to today's episode of Who Did That Voice? If you enjoyed today's episode, please check us out online on all social media platforms at Who Did That Voice and on YouTube at Who Did That Voice 24. Also, remember to check out our website, whodidthatvoice.org. Again, that's www.whodidthatvoice.org. Thank you to all my listeners out there. I just wanted to say, if you want to partner with Who Did That Voice, just telling your friends and family about us is the best way to share the show with others. And or leaving us a review on Apple Podcast or wherever you get your podcast from. The third and final way is by joining our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Who Did That Voice. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time for more discoveries on Who Did That Voice.